Welcome everyone to a new series that I'm starting where I will pretty much be reading from books, various history books that I happen to have in my possession to kind of do something a little different from my usual content. So to start today, we're going to read from the Napoleonic Wars by Richard Holmes. And pretty much this book is going to cover the entire Napoleonic Wars, as the title suggests. We'll read through two to three chapters per episode, because they're, they're relatively small chapters. We're going to start with the introduction, the age of Napoleon. Fear periods of history are more resonantly defined by the name of one man, Napoleon. Napoleon bestrode early 19th century Europe like the proverbial Colossus. By 1812, most of the continent was under his control. His writ ran from southern Spain to the Baltic and from the Atlantic to Russia. He had defeated all but one of the great powers. And save for Britain's moat defensive, it is hard to see how the country could have been spared. He had installed family members on half a dozen thrones, dictated terms to the heads of ancient dynasties, and married the Holy Roman Emperor's daughter. He had recast his country's administrative, educational, and legal systems, stabilized its currency, and set up the Bank of France, created a new aristocracy, and instituted the Légion d'Honneur. He was a patron of the arts and filled French museums with the spoils of his conquests. He was the towering figure of his age and foresaw that his achievements would make it impossible for even opponents to ignore him. It will be difficult to make me disappear from the public memory. French historians will have to deal with the empire and will have to give me my rightful due. But what is his rightful due? As you look back at Napoleon, it is difficult not to be both attracted and repelled. And in my own lifetime, I have rarely been able to strike a balanced view. My mother took me to Paris when I was 10 years old and the sight of Napoleon's tomb shining coldly beneath the dome of Les Invalides stirred my emotions in a way that I still remember today. When I was researching for my doctorate in the archives at Bessien, I was within musket shot of the ditch where the Duc d'Anghen kidnapped from neutral Baden was shot by a firing squad in 1804. The victim of judicial murder, my former idol, had blood on his hands. On a dozen battlefields, from Austerlitz to Wagram, I have seen a man who could defeat huge armies as he did at Austerlitz, pulverize the military giant of its day as he did at Jena, and dart between larger opponents, lunging at each in turn as he did in France in 1814. He could inspire the fiercest loyalty when Napoleon was hit in the ankle at Ratisbon in 1809. There was a rumor that he was badly wounded and men flocked in from all directions. Light cavalry officer Marcelin Marbeau saw how in a moment thousands of men surrounded Napoleon in spite of the enemy cannon fire which concentrated on this huge group. In 1803, Young Charles Perkin, a trooper in the Chasseur de Cheval, was a sentry outside Napoleon's quarters. I still recall with what joy and pride I did sentry duty outside the apartment he was occupying. I did not think I have ever known a finer experience than my sentry duty outside the door of a man on whom the eyes of all Europe were already fixed. A young officer mortally wounded before taking a message to Napoleon, braced up for his last duty. 
You are wounded, said the emperor. No, sire, killed, said the youngster proudly. When General Levesque de la Fiere was having his leg amputated in 1814, during the operation, which he bore with great courage, the general repeatedly called out, Long live the emperor. Yet Napoleon could inspire such behavior with utter cynicism. He said that a man would not sell his life, but would give it away for a piece of ribbon. If he was merciless to Aung Hen, he could be brutal on a far larger scale. In 1799, he ordered his men to kill perhaps 2,000 Turkish prisoners, some of whom were bayoneted to save ammunition. He was a consummate liar. When a secretary, penning a characteristically mendacious dispatch for him, acknowledged that I had found it painful recording these official words at his dictation, Napoleon retorted, You are a simpleton. You really don't understand a thing. He could be callous, telling his wife Josephine that he was divorcing her because she could not conceive. Madam, I need a wound. He could not distinguish the interests of France from his own leading one historian who suggested that three million men were killed in his wars to claim that the memory of Genghis Khan paled in comparison. So there is no simple view to take. A figure of Napoleon's extraordinary stature both dazzles and burns. We're now going to begin with Chapter 1, The Revolutionary Background. But for the French Revolution, Napoleone de Buonaparte, who until 1796 customarily spelled his name in the Italian fashion, might never have come to history's notice, remaining just an obscure artillery officer. However, when a blast of radical change blew away most of those in authority, from King Louis XVI himself to many junior officers and minor officials, it swept in new men, several of whom speedily fell victim to a monster which devoured its own children. For the agile and ambitious, this was a time of extraordinary opportunity, as well as great danger. The revolution's proximate cause was the summoning of the Estates General, a national assembly with medieval antecedents, representing the nobility, the clergy, and the third estate all those belonging to neither of the two preceding classes, to discuss finances. These had been ruined by the American War of Independence, in which France played a decisive part in helping Britain's colonies throw off their yoke. Deeper causes included resistance to absolute monarchy amongst the largely tax-exempt privileged classes. Royal authority was weakened by the growing revolt of the Estates General and as Maximilien Robespierre, who became a leader of the extremists, admitted, the people appeared on the scene only later. They were encouraged to do so because a bad harvest in 1788 followed a period of economic deterioration, characterized by high unemployment. Food shortages were extirpated by rumors that monopolists were causing scarcity for their own ends. The Third Estate constructed its program based on Cahiers' lists of grievances, which testified, amongst other things, to the desire of the urban middle class to gain equality with the more privileged, and for the peasants to escape obligations rooted in the feudal past. The Estates General met on 5th of May, 1789, and on the 17th of June, the Third Estate exacerbated by the ruling that the estates should sit and vote separately, declared itself the National Assembly, and a number of noblemen and clergy joined it. In an atmosphere full of wild rumors, the crowds that thronged the capital sought arms to defend themselves against a military coup. Early on the 14th of July, they found some at Les Invalides and moved on to the Bastille. A fortress and state prison on the eastern edge of Paris, which surrendered after a brief defense. Three days later, Louis went to the Hotel de Ville 
to receive the new national cockade of red, white, and blue. But on 6th of October, a mob invaded the king's palace at Versailles and took him back to Paris. The Declaration of Rights, passed by the Assembly on the 26th of August, had affirmed that men were free and equal, and that sovereignty resided in the people. Church lands were sold off, and paper money was issued. And the Constituent Assembly discussed wholesale reform. As old institutions were swept away, real power resided in the political clubs like the Jacobins and the Cordeliers. In June of 1791, the king and queen failed in an escape attempt, and although Louis had a new monarchical constitution, things were spiraling out of control. In August of 1791, Austria and Prussia affirmed their readiness to help Louis. Meanwhile, France itself became increasingly bellicose, declaring war on Austria and Prussia in April of the following year. Early French reverses and counter-revolutionary movements in the provinces encouraged the growth of extremism. And in August of 1792, the Paris mob stormed the Tuileries. A national convention, elected by universal suffrage, replaced the Legislative Assembly. This new body declared France a republic, but in early September, the mob massacred hundreds of prisoners, showing how unstable things had become. In January of 1793, Louis was executed for treason. And the next month, the convention went on to declare war on Britain and Holland. The new executive, the Committee of Public Safety, was supported by a convention purged of moderates and dominated by the left-wing majority called the Mountain. In a spasm of terror, the guillotine claimed the lives of Queen Marie Antoinette, counter-revolutionaries, unsuccessful generals, and revolutionaries alike. The revolutionary Camille Desmoulins quipped that the gods were thirsty, but himself died in the spring of 1794, when members of two rival factions were guillotined. From the 10th of June to the 27th of July, some 1,376 prisoners were executed in Paris. Dismaying politicians who feared that they too would be engulfed. On the 28th and 29th of July, Robespierre and his Jacobin adherents, authors of the worst extremism, were themselves executed. This thermidory reaction was consolidated when the army supported the convention against the mob in May of 1795, and a new constitution was ratified by plebiscite. On the 5th of October, the mob again assailed the convention, but was dispersed by troops. The cannon whose whiff of grapeshot winnowed the rioters were commanded, as we shall soon see, by a young brigadier general called Napoleon Bonaparte. A new executive, the Directory, now worked with a moderate convention to bring the first stability France had enjoyed for six years. We will now enter Chapter 2, The Making of a Reputation. On the 15th of August, 1769, Letizia Bonaparte was hurried to her home in the Corsican capital, Ajaccio, to give birth to a boy, who was christened Napoleone. His father, Carlo Maria, who now called himself Charles, was a lawyer who had supported Pauli's Corsican nationalists, but after their defeat by the French earlier in the same year, had gone on well with the authorities and served as a municipal councillor. He capitalized on his status in the minor nobility to secure support for his burgeoning family, and in 1779, Napoleon, for such we will now call him, entered the royal school at Brienne in Champagne with a scholarship. The boy was unhappy. His small stature and appalling French encouraged bullying, but he would not be coerced. When a master sought to make him eat on his knees, he reposted, In my family we kneel only before God. His reports were mixed. Most testified to academic success, 
especially in mathematics, but also to an imperious and stubborn character. In October of 1784, aged just 15, he moved to the École Militaire in Paris. Hopeless at drill in German, he again excelled at mathematics, though when he was commissioned into the artillery in 1785, he ranked 42nd out of 52 students. Stationed at Valence, Napoleon spent much of his time in private study. In 1787, he enjoyed a long leave trying to sort out family affairs, for his father had just died and did not return to his regiment. Now at Axion, until June of 1788. Here he was influenced by the talented commandant of the artillery school, Baron Dutel, who not only developed Napoleon's skills in gunnery, but helped lay the foundations of the tactical concepts which he would later develop to such outstanding effect. However, he was dismally short of money, and in 1788 endured a long illness. On the 1st of April, 1792, Napoleon was elected lieutenant colonel in the Ajaccio Volunteers, but helped suppress riots too vigorously and earned the displeasure of Pauli. He then heard that his regiment in France had ordered a snap muster of all officers and had struck his name from his rolls. Napoleon rushed to Paris, where he witnessed the storming of the Tuileries, and returned confirmed as a regular captain and volunteer lieutenant colonel. Napoleon's baptism of fire occurred in Sardinia, where in early 1793 an expedition from Corsica was ignominiously repulsed. Worse, it was clear that he was now unwelcome in Corsica, and in June of 1793 he moved his family to France and resumed his duties there. While he was collecting a gunpowder convoy, a royalist revolt broke out in the Midi, and Napoleon helped suppress it. Unrest spread to Toulon, which admitted an Anglo-Spanish fleet. Napoleon replaced General Carteau's wounded artillery commander, and his fierce energy and consummate professional skill made him the hero of a siege which ended victoriously on the 19th of December. He was made temporary brigadier general three days later, and confirmed in the rank in February of 1794. Napoleon, friend of Robespierre's brother, and author of a Jacobin-inspired play, was imprisoned in August after the Thermidorian reaction. Released two weeks later, he helped ensure a satisfactory end to the year's campaigning in Italy. But, exacerbating at being shunted off to an insignificant command, resigned. Military reversals led to his rapid reinstatement, but he was again removed from the army and Napoleon was technically a civilian when Paul Barras, a member of the Directory, summoned him on the 5th of October, 1795, to protect the Convention against the Insurrection. Napoleon opened fire on the Paris mob with artillery, his whiff of grape shot effectively ending the revolt. His action on that day was decisive. By its end, his political support matched his military reputation. And that is where we're going to end for today. Next time, we'll begin with Chapter 3, Artillery. I'll see you all next time. Take care.